Hello everyone uh, and welcome to the first of RMIT's uh, election uh, cyber election series uh, webinars. Uh, my name is Professor Matt Wine. I am the director of RMIT Center for Cybersecurity Research and Innovation and a professor of cybersecurity here at RMIT University. I'm delighted to host today's first uh, webinar and uh, to interview Senator James Patterson. Now, before we begin, uh, I'd just like to make an acknowledgement of country. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Ryung and Bunyang language groups of the Eastern Kulon Nation, on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of RMIT University, and the lands that I'm speaking to you from today. As we gather virtually across the many different parts of the country and the world, we'd also acknowledge, we'd also encourage you to acknowledge the lands in which you are joining us from. We respectfully acknowledge the First Nation people of the five Kulon nations, their ancestors and elders, past, present, and emerging. So uh, in terms of today, uh, we're using uh, the Microsoft Teams live uh, webinar. So uh, today's interactive, so you get the opportunity to post uh, questions uh, to uh, Senator Patterson. So if you use uh, uh, to post questions at the top of your screen, top right, uh, there's uh, the a little bubble that says Q&A and you can post your questions there. Uh, we also have uh, closed captions uh, abilities as well. So uh, if you just click on that CC uh, bubble, it would uh, translate uh, the event uh, in real time. So um, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Senator James Patterson uh, for our first uh, RMIT Cyber Election uh, Seminar. Uh, Sen Senator Patterson is a Liberal Senator for Victoria, first elected in March 2016 at the age of 28. Senator Patterson is the youngest Liberal ever elected to the Senate. During his time in the Senate, he has fought for Australia's prosperity, freedom, democracy and sovereignty. He is the chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, the deputy chair of the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19, and the former chair of the Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services and the Senate Finance and Public Administration Committee. Senator Patterson is also the Australian co-chair of the Inter-Parliamentary Alliance on China, the co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Museums, Libraries and Galleries, co-patron of Liberals Friends of Israel, and deputy chair of the Modest Member Society, a group of coalition MPs committed to champion free markets and economic freedom. Prior to entering the Senator at uh, the Senate, James was uh, Deputy Executive Director of uh, the Free Market Think Tank, the Institute of Public Affairs. He has previously worked for the Victorian Employers Chamber of Commerce and Industry and in the office of uh, Senator the Honourable Mitch Fairfield. James is a member of the Richmond Football Club and lives in Melbourne with his wife Lydia and their two children. So uh, thank you uh, Senator Patterson uh, for joining us uh, today. So uh, what uh, in terms of the structure of today there's uh, a number of questions we'll start the, the seminar with and then we'll throw it open to any questions uh, and I see there's already some that are coming uh, from uh, the uh, audience. So my first question uh, Senator Patterson is can you talk to us broadly about your party's policies and strategies related to the cyber security if we elected? Um, Professor Warren, thank you very much for the invitation to be here with today. I, I really value the work that you and your colleagues do at RMIT, both in terms of the expertise and insight that you provide through your research and contributions to public debate, uh, but also the way in which 
RMIT is helping to train our future cybersecurity uh, workforce. In fact, uh, the meeting I had in my office just before uh, this uh, discussion was with an RMIT graduate who's doing amazing things, uh, running his own business in the cybersecurity space. And I'm sure we'll get la in later to the, to the workforce challenges and the training challenges that we face. Um, and we can talk a bit more about that. Um, talking about uh, our agenda for the next term, um, let's just briefly repack, uh, re revisit some of the things we've done in this term because it's been an incredibly busy time in the area of cyber security. Uh, the reason for that is, is that cyber has very clearly emerged in addition to the traditional domains of conflict of air, land and sea as the fourth domain of conflict uh, and or the new battlefield, uh, along with space, which many people are calling the fifth battlefield. And we are seeing increasing efforts by not just uh, foreign nation states, but also uh, sophisticated cyber criminals uh, seek to use uh, our vulnerabilities and our openness as a weapon uh, against us and take advantage of those weaknesses for uh, criminal uh, financial gain and to attempt to uh, weaken us as a country in an, a, in an era of increasing global strategic competition and particularly in our region. Uh, so the government's done an enormous amount of things in the last few years, in particular the passage of critical infrastructure legislation, which I know we'll get into more detail about uh, in the Q&A, uh, but also you might have seen in the budget the Red Spice initiative, which involves $10 billion of new funding to the Australian Signals Directorate over the next five years to effectively allow them to double their workforce that will put them on par with some of the most elite and capable uh, offensive and defensive cyber agencies in the world. Um, we've also released uh, details of our ransomware action plan uh, and there'll be a lot of uh, implementation of that in the next term. Uh, from my point of view, I think the most critical thing for us to bed down is the critical infrastructure reforms because mm. critical infrastructure is particularly vulnerable and it is uh, there are businesses within those 11 uh, critical infrastructure sectors which are systemically important to our country wh whom if they went down in the event of a cyber attack would have uh, major ramifications for our country and the new obligations imposed on many of those uh, through the Critical Infrastructure Act uh, will take some time to work through and implement. We have to lift their, lift their cyber security standards, their cyber literacy, uh, their cyber security, because otherwise we're leaving ourselves very vulnerable uh, as a country. Thank you. And in relation to the Critical Infrastructure Act, there's you know a, a new bill uh, that was going through Parliament. In terms of the future, do you see that there's going to be change in obligations or mm. uh, broader changes around critical infrastructure? A, a, as you've mentioned, you know, is yeah. you know it becomes much much more important for Australia. Yeah, so, so two bills have recently passed the parliament, both of which went through the uh, Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, one just before Christmas last year and one in February this year. Uh, and they did slightly different things. One of them uh, gave the power to the Australian Signals Directorate to step in in the event of a crisis when a, a critical infrastructure operator is unwilling or unable mm -hmm. Uh, to protect themselves. It expanded the number of critical infrastructures cut, uh, sectors cut from four to 11, uh, and it introduced mandatory reporting obligations for serious cybersecurity in uh, incidents for uh, businesses within those sectors. The more recent package of reforms also uh, imposed some positive security obligations or effectively risk management programs on uh, critical infrastructure providers. Now, at this stage, um, I don't see an immediate need for further expansion of those 11 mm. sectors. I think it's a fairly comprehensive uh, uh, set of sectors. However, um, this is a constantly evolving uh, policy environment and as mm. new uh, issues arise and new challenges arise, we will have to, to uh, respond to that. As I indicated in my previous answer, it'll be bedding down those hmm. changes within those 11 sectors right now, which is the priority. Some of them, uh, some of those sectors are quite mature, have quite sophisticated risk management plans in place already, invest already very heavily uh, in their cyber security, but some of them are not very mature at all and have a long way to go. And we've got to work uh, hand in hand with those private sector operators to lift those standards up. No, thank you. And in certain countries around the world have sort of moved into regulations and uh, regulatory authorities when it comes to cyber security. Do, do you think that would happen in Australia with our critical infrastructure uh, protection and implementation? Mm. Yes, yeah, certainly there are you know, pretty uh, substantial regulations in this most recent package of reforms and a lot of the evidence that was put to the Intelligence Committee during the inquiry was some anxiety about the costs that that would impose, the regulatory costs that would impose. Um, our judgment based on the um, 
classified and unclassified threat assessments were received from both uh, civil society expert organisations and from uh, our intelligence agencies was that even though some costs would be imposed, uh, the failure to act and the failure to address this would be far more costly in the long run. Um, but you're right, internationally, there's a lot of uh, developments in this place. I've just returned from a, a, a bipartisan delegation of the Intelligence Committee to the United States and the United Kingdom, and they are looking very closely at the reforms that we've enacted. In fact, while I was there, the US Senate agreed to a mandatory reporting obligation on uh, for serious cyber security incidents. Um, the United Kingdom is having a debate about that as well, and they are looking at our reforms and seeing what uh, elements of that could be adapted, because this is a problem that we're all grappling with. And unfortunately, we have, uh, whether it's Colonial Pipeline or JBS Meets or Fairfax or many of the other high profile attacks we've seen on, on private sector businesses, um, we have reminders on a regular basis of what uh, of the environment we're operating in and the need to meet that challenge. And certainly one of the things that we see with critical infrastructure is, is that partnership with government and the private sector. In terms of the policies and regulations that have been developed, what was the engagement with those operators, I suppose, also into the future, what would be the engagement with those sort of private sector operators? Mm. Yeah, in my, in my six years uh, in Parliament and chairing various committees across a range of economic and um, national security areas, uh, I've never met a stakeholder who thought there had been too much consultation. It is often a common theme of feedback that they would like even more consultation. And certainly the recommendation that we made in response to the first critical infrastructure bill last year was that the bill should be split in two to allow more time for consultation, particularly on the regulatory costs that were going to be imposed on industry. And to their credit, the Department of Home Affairs, I think, really took that um, recommendation to heart and has conducted very extensive additional consultation with the affected industries. But even in the most recent report before our, the last package uh, of reforms passed, ongoing consultation on the implementation of those reforms has been a, a key theme of our uh, recommendations to government, which the government has agreed. And we've recommended further reviews, both independent reviews and a review by our committee to make sure that uh, that is happening in practice, because this really is a problem that, face, that we must meet jointly. Neither the private mm -hmm. sector nor government can meet it on their own. It's too complex and too big of a challenge. And so it's really important that we have good working relationships one of the most positive developments in my view in the last five years has been standing up of the Australian Cyber Security Centre within the Signals Directorate as that key point of liaison with the private sector and the communication and the sharing of threat intelligence and other insights between the private sector and ASD, I think has grown in leaps and bounds over the last five years. And the Red Spice investment in ASD will allow that to be expanded even further and for that cooperation to become even tighter and closer. And I think that's critical if we're going to meet this challenge. Excellent, thank you. And, and you mentioned uh, before, Senator Patterson, about the impact of, of, of ransomware. And I, I, I wonder if you could share with us your thoughts about, you know, uh, the mandatory requirements uh, for disclosure ransomware attacks on, on yep. large organisations, and, and I suppose also smaller organisations, whether that should also be mandatory. Yeah, this is a really fraught issue. There's a lot of debate about um, to what extent this should be mandatory or not. Um, certainly, I, I would be concerned about mandatory public reporting of ransomware attacks. I think that could have um, very unintended adverse consequences of drawing attention to um, businesses or sectors which are vulnerable. Um, and I think a, a blanket requirement for mandatory reporting across all industries and across all businesses um, would be both burdensome potentially for industry, but also uh, costly for government. Really what we want to understand is the highest risk and highest value reporting and make sure that that's happening. And that's part of the obligations imposed uh, by the Critical Infrastructure Act. So it's only applying to those 11 sectors and it's only applying to the most significant uh, operators in those sectors, not the smallest businesses, because I think it would be an undue regulatory burden. Um, but I think that is a really important obligation because um, there have been examples in the recent past where a uh, significant uh, business has reported a ransomware attack and ASD has been able to use some of the indicators, the early indicators of that attack to thwart mm. other attacks on other mm. sectors. And so it's a really important thing, not just for the company themselves to come forward and get potentially some technical assistance to overcome it, but to help us to alert others that they might be targets of similar types of intrusions in the future. So that that is really important. And I think that just the reality of the world we're operating in now. No, thank you. And uh, 
in terms you, you mentioned uh, with your introduction uh the the issues around skills and and our cyber for instance you know have identified the need you know for 17000 cyber security professionals in, in terms of a sovereign capability for the whole of the country how from your perspective do we increase our cyber workforce mm. When I talk to young people uh, on university campuses and in schools, if they have any interest at all in, in national security or any interest, in, interest at all in technology, I tell them that um, they couldn't do worse than uh, focusing on cyber security. They have a great career ahead of them if that's an area they want to specialise in because there is a, a significant and increasing demand for those technical skills and uh, and they will have their, their features uh, laid out for them very well if they go down that path. Um, you know, Red Spice alone is going to require the doubling of ASD, about almost 2,000 new people employed um, for the government. And of course, the private sector has its own uh, needs as well, very serious needs, which you've, you've laid out there. Um, the good thing is that, um, you know, young people are interested in this and they're responding to this. Um, if they are confident that they'll have a future, then they will choose to study in these areas and uh, they'll choose to specialise. And uh, but we have to make sure that um, organisations like yours are well equipped to mm. deal with that expanded demand that I think you're going to face over the next few years and well resourced for that. Um, and of course, the, the government has a role in, in training people up who then go on to work in the private sector. Um, we don't necessarily want people to come and work at ASD for their whole lives, although that might be appropriate for them. There's great value in them coming and doing things that they can uniquely do while they're at government and then going out into the private sector and taking those skills into private industry because we want to lift their levels of uh, sophistication as well. And and I suppose one of the impacts that we've seen with my uh, with COVID is is the impact of on, on migration. Uh, you know that it it's been hard to bring in you know uh, skilled people from overseas in the cybersecurity domain. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is an issue across a, a range of sectors and a range of scarce skill areas that effectively Australia's borders were closed to international migrants for two years. Um, I'm very pleased that they're now open again and some of those critical workers are coming back in, but it will take a while to get back to the kind of levels of skilled migration that we had in the past. But that's going to be an essential component of it. Um, we are not from homegrown capability be out, going to be able to meet all of that need. Um, there will be amazing opportunities for Australians uh, who want to work in this field, but we're going to need even more than we could ever provide for ourselves. And so having that skilled migration channel open and flowing again smoothly is going to be important. And I suppose also linked to that is, is there's the education component, but there's also, I suppose, the awareness perspective within society because is everyone has the potential to be you know a victim of of cyber crime or a victim of a cyber attack so what's your view of the coalition in terms of raising cyber security awareness generally across society yeah, that's a really good point because um, the legislation that we've introduced by its very nature must focus on on the biggest players because they're the ones who have the capacity to meet the, the cost of that uh, burden. Um, we could never impose uh, these kind of burdens on, on small businesses or let alone individuals. It just wouldn't be sustainable. And no matter how big the Australian Signals Directorate is and how big the Cyber Security Centre is, um, it is going to have to use a risk-based matrix to allocate its resources to the area of highest uh, need and highest uh, demand. So part of the uh, the challenge is raising cyber literacy and security literacy, particularly across the community, um, because the important thing for everyone to understand is you don't have to be technically proficient to protect yourselves. And there's some basic things you can do in your own best interest, including you know updating uh, regularly uh, on your uh, mobile devices, making sure that your um, software is up to date. You can set an automatic feature in Apple or Android features to make sure that happens. Having a sophisticated passphrase instead of a simple password um, goes a long way to protecting yourself uh, and multi-factor authentication which is becoming increasingly mandatory for a lot of services whether it's banking or elsewhere that can protect you against some of these most low sophistication phishing attacks which we're all subject to um, uh, even yeah, as i said the biggest signal structure in the world can't protect every phone in australia but yeah. you can do some basic things yourself to protect yourself and I suppose one of the things we've also seen uh, recently is around cyber safety and the importance of cyber safety for society. Uh, what, what's your view around, you know, cyber safety and the steps that the government has taken in that regard? Yeah, in fact, it, it was just over the weekend that the Prime Minister with the Communications Minister, Paul Fletcher, announced the next steps in our online safety uh, policies uh, because one of the um, most 
uh, troubling uh, and significant pieces of feedback that we all receive through our election offices is stories of young people being uh, harassed and bullied and victimised online. And uh, the online environment is a very challenging environment to protect young people from who are um, increasingly can use devices uh, in, in private away from the visibility of their parents or teachers or carers um, and can access content which is harmful to them and can become victims of uh, online predators. Uh, and so part of that is working with industry to make sure that the key uh, service providers are doing everything they can within their powers to protect young people online. Frankly, I think the tech industry has been too slow on this and um, you know consumers are demanding better uh, from their providers to make sure that they um, make this a real priority for them um, because if you I mean a bad user experience for a young person um, should be of the concern of, a, of, of the tech industry um, without the government ever having to mandate it but if it's necessary to mandate it then we will and we're looking at you know very uh, serious penalties for people who are caught engaging in this kind of harassment um, uh, online. Thank you. And and from a I suppose from a geopolitical situation, what do you see as being the role of Australia in our in our region that you know in the South Pacific in terms of lifting cyber resilience or cyber security capability of 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 our neighbours? Yeah, well, we have a really strong interest in our neighbours in our immediate region in particular, having uh, the ability to uh, have safe and secure networks. It's one of the reasons mm. why we've invested very heavily on things like undersea cables in the Pacific to make sure that they can have trusted, reliable partners to work there and secure communications that they can have confidence in. Um, but we also uh, want to make sure that uh, their cyber capabilities um, in the government sector and the private sector uh, are being enhanced. And we're having increasingly close working relationships regionally on those issues as well as globally, um, because we are in a position to provide some technical assistance and advice to them, uh, as well as training and uh, to help them mature their capabilities. Um, because it is no good uh, Australia being um, a, a secure fort, um, but our region being vulnerable. So we are investing more than we ever have before in those capabilities. And I suppose linked to that is, <clears throat> as you mentioned before, is is that global context is is the world is changing very quickly before before our eyes. Mm -hmm. And 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 what role does Australia have from a cyber context in this new changing environment mm -hmm. globally? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, one, we need to be a really active voice in the establishment of international standards that are robust and protect the rules-based order that reflect the values of liberal democracies and the rule of law. This is an increasingly contested space and our diplomats are very active in pushing back against those who want to make the international uh, security environment permissive and protective of um, underhand uh, and what we regard as illegal and unethical behaviour online um, and we've been playing a leading role along with our partners who share our values and share our interests on those things um, but we also need to send a very clear message to our adversaries that um, mm. uh, taking action against Australia in the cyber realm will not be without its costs and there will be consequences. Uh, already ASD is a very capable uh, offensive cyber operator but Red Spice as I mentioned will increase mm. their ability to do that and we're working very closely with our Five Eyes partners in particular uh, to complement their capabilities and to make it very clear uh, to anyone whether they are a, um, a nation state or whether they are a um, cyber criminal uh, gang um, that we can hit you back if you choose to hit us. And, and, and I suppose is you mentioned uh, that that global aspects where do you see the United Nations playing a role in this sort of cyber space issues? It, you know, you, you, the, as you've alluded to, there's a number of sort of regional alliances that are now developed, like, like the, the, the Quad Alliance. The, does the United Nations have a role to play f from a global perspective in this space? Uh, absolutely, it does. Um, as part of the uh, Intelligence Committee delegation, we went to New York and we visited the United Nations and we discussed um, these and, and related issues with them. It's an issue that, that the UN is grappling with um, and one that it finds challenging because it is so many uh, active players uh, trying to shape these outcomes, some of whom are very influential and some of whom are, are not, don't feel bound in the same way Australia does by mm. international norms and conventions and are seeking, frankly, to undermine them. Um, so it's one of the um, really top concerns of our diplomats to try and influence that conversation and influence the international policy development in that space um, to be rules respecting and consistent with the rules of the road that we've established uh, in the post-war era, whether that's the international maritime 
uh, conventions that we've established um, uh, and other conventions that um, seek to respect the sovereignty of states and the rights of the individual uh, and the self-determination of people uh, both in the real world and, and online. There's, there should be no difference uh, between those two uh, realms. Thank you. Um, so, Senator Patterson, the, the, the world is changing uh, from a technology perspective and we're seeing, you know, new technologies, you know, transforming our day to day lives and, and, and that trend is just going to, you know, evolve into the future. In regards to people's, you know, concerns around privacy and data protection, do you think the laws that we have in place are, are, are adequate for citizens and the economy, mm -hmm. or, or do you think there would be changes that will happen in the future as this, you know, digi digital economy evolves even further? I think we've made some really good progress uh, on the question of sovereign data uh, storage. I think that's an incredibly mm. important component of it um, because we want to make sure that the sensitive uh, private data of Australians, whether it's held by government uh, or industry, is stored in a way that we can have confidence in that it has very clear legal status. And, and I think that's going to be a, a further uh, there's going to be further evolution in that area, but our, our government's made it very clear to international providers that we expect them to, um, to store secure, securely sensitive data onshore. Um, and I absolutely understand the concerns that Australians have about their privacy. I think, uh, by and large, the development of encryption has been a positive trend uh, and it's something that I support, although it does pose very real challenges for our law enforcement and intelligence agencies where uh, it's not only um, law abiding private citizens like us who are taking advantage of it to protect their privacy, uh, but people with nefarious aims and objectives trying to mask uh, their uh, online behaviour uh, using anonymising or encrypted uh, uh, communication challenges, mm. uh, channels, and that is a real challenge. One of the pieces of legislation that our committee considered and the parliament agreed to was the identify and disrupt legislation, uh, mm. which is about giving our uh, law enforcement uh, and intelligence agencies the power to get on and disrupt some of those networks um, to make sure that they're not being used to do harm to Australians online. Mm. And, and I suppose that this was something that came uh, through the through the Critical Infrastructure Act was that data slash cloud, uh, you know, is is considered a, an area of of key critical infrastructure for Australia because of, you know so much depends on our cloud services and, and data services as well. So so linked to those privacy aspects about protecting cloud and data storage, do you think there would be a major a bigger focus on the security? security aspects as well. Yeah, look, it's a particularly important industry um, in its own right, but also as a service provider mm. to other critical infrastructure providers, whether that's a water or electricity utility or a, a bank or another financial institution. Um, so uh, there's going to have to be increasingly uh, strong relationships and, and cooperative relationships between government and the uh, data storage and cloud uh, sector um, because they have an indispensable role to play. Now, they're a very sophisticated industry when it comes to cyber security. And although they've been captured in the Critical Infrastructure Act, I suspect most of the obligations imposed upon them uh, will be far less onerous than the things they already do for their own good business reasons in their own interests of their shareholders and their customers. Um, uh, so I suspect most of that's effectively redundant for them. But we want to make sure that all providers, uh, not just the largest and, and ones we're most familiar with, are meeting those standards and that, that smaller uh, providers that are active in this space are all also have to meet those high standards. So, and I suppose also linked to that, and you mentioned this before about space is, you know, we have space defined as part of Australia's critical infrastructure. We have a new space command uh, within Australia. We have a new uh, civil uh, centre for space industry. In the yeah. future, how important do you think space will be for Australia? I suppose from a security perspective, but also from a citizen's perspective as well. Look, well, incredibly important. It is one of the most hotly contested domains. I mean, we have seen in the last few years uh, uh, actions of uh, Russia and China mm -hmm. in space that are incredibly alarming, whether it was uh, taking out one of their own satellites and spreading mm -hmm. debris uh, all over the place or um, moving a satellite uh, out of orbit and effectively making mm. it inoperable. Um, this is a, a really hotly contested domain and by its very nature, almost everything in the space domain is dual use. It can have mm. 
completely innocent civilian applications, but it can also have military and strategic applications. So I think it's really important both to take advantage of the economic opportunities, but also to secure our security and strategic interests that we stood up, not just an Australian uh, Space Agency, who I visited in, in Adelaide recently, mm. but also that, as you mentioned, Space Command within uh, the ADF underneath the Air Force, um, which I think is just going to be incredibly critical in the future. Um, again, coming back to Red Spice, you know, the investment mm. uh, in that will uh, enhance our capabilities at Pine Gap and without going into uh, more detail than would be appropriate in an unclassified forum. Um, that's an incredibly important provider of um, signals intelligence of the space domain, not just for Australia, but for the entire Five Eyes network. But by the very nature of our geographical location, it's a very important capability. No, f thank you for that, uh, Senator Patterson. Uh, we're going to go now to uh, some of the questions that have been posted from the audience. So I, I, I see that there's been uh, a number of questions. So please feel free, you know, to also, you know, continue to post those questions. And um, I wonder, uh, the first question, I suppose, is a very topical question, is does the situation in the Ukraine have an impact on Australia from a cyber context? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. It was one of the key topics of conversation on our intelligence committee delegation to the US and UK because um, we were on that delegation in the early days of the war. And a lot of the published public analysis of the conflict before it was initiated indicated that cyber offensive operations would be a likely precursor or early yeah. element of the Russian offence against Ukraine. Um, I think it would be fair to say that um, that has not been anywhere near as impactful or effective mm. on behalf of Russia as we all might have assumed it was the case. Um, it was astonishing to many observers in the early days that, for example, the Ukrainian communications, telecommunications network was able to mm. be maintained and up and running, that the electricity grid uh, wasn't destabilised. And there's some really interesting questions for us all to reflect upon about why that was the case. Now, um, I suspect probably um, some analysts uh, underestimated uh, the Ukrainian capabilities uh, in defending those networks and also the assistance that the Ukrainian uh, uh, authorities had from uh, the rest of the world in, in achieving that task. I think it's possible that they also overestimated the Russian capabilities, um, just as the Russian capabilities um, in, a, in the physical world uh, mm. were overestimated. Um, perhaps their cyber capabilities were also overestimated. Um, and perhaps also overestimated was their willingness to deploy some of those mm. tools because um, uh, it was a, certainly the initial part of the Russian invasion plan was to quickly conquer and dominate Ukraine. And if that was the case, they would need to use um, those networks, whether they, they be telecommunications or electricity themselves, if they intended to, to run and govern the country. And so that might have restrained them in their use of some of those uh, tools. Um, but I think it's, uh, although it's been a kind of a, a cautionary tale in that sense, cyber has not been as big an element as people might have thought it was. I, I think it's highly likely to be the, the case in the future um, that nation states will seek to destabilise their adversaries in advance of conflict in a region. Um, and you, it's not difficult, you don't require much imagination to see how devastating that would be for a country like Australia if as a prelude to a regional crisis, one of our adversaries sought to uh, dismantle our payment systems network or our electricity network yeah. or our telecommunications network, that would obviously limit our ability to project our power into the region in support of our values uh, or in support of our allies. So that's one of the underlying reasons for mm. all this uh, investment uh, and focus on critical infrastructure and hardening our systems against those potential attacks. And, and I suppose linked to, I suppose, the cyber warfare aspects in the Ukraine, there's also the information warfare yeah. campaign in, in, in the fact, you know, the propaganda, you know, that's come from Russia or, you know, people on behalf of Russia yes. a, about the situation. What, what impact do you think that that information warfare aspects sort of having? Yeah, I have a very strong view about this. In fact, um, touched on it in a speech I gave in London to the Henry Jackson Society. Um, for too long, I think we've identified the information warfare space as a weakness of open and free societies and as a strength of authoritarian and closed societies when we should be thinking about it in reverse. We've been very focused, understandably, on potential foreign election interference, which is a very serious issue, and attempts to um, uh, influence our democracies through social media because we're inherently open societies. Um, and that does provide some vectors for in interference. But by being an open society, we're also 
quite a resilient society. We can um, accommodate dissenting viewpoints and it doesn't totally destabilize our democracies or weaken us. Whereas authoritarian societies are very brittle and they're very vulnerable to um, alternative sources of information. Uh, and there's nothing a dictator fears more than their own people learning the truth about their administration. And if we can get the truth out, we can be very effective. And Ukraine's demonstrated this uh, immensely effectively. I think they've massively outplayed the Russians mm. in the information warfare space, which no one would have predicted prior to this. Everyone would have thought that would have been a Russian strength. But mm. in conjunction with the rapid declassification of Western intelligence, particularly through Five Eyes, that really removed any pretext that Russia had for the war that identified their false flag operations before they were delivered. You know, Ukraine has got the message out very quickly about Russian military failures uh, mm. and about the poor morale among uh, Russian soldiers and conscripts uh, about their supply line challenges. And that has humiliated the Russian, uh, the Putin regime on the international stage and demonstrated that actually Ukrainians are up for this fight and that we should rally to their cause and we have rallied to their cause. So um, I think this is a great template for the future. I think we need to think uh, more creatively in the future about how we can use information war against uh, those closed authoritarian societies. No, f thank you. Uh, the, the, the next question that, that we have is um, I from a, a government structure perspective is um, under a future coalition government, uh, would a dedicated cyber security minister be appointed or would the responsibility still sit under, you know, uh, the Minister of Defence portfolio? Yeah, this is an interesting question. I think it does need to remain in the defence portfolio and there's a really important reason for that is you cannot separate our offensive capabilities from our defensive capabilities. They work hand in hand. So it is critically important that the Australian Signals Directorate, which is has its history and has its um, legal powers and authorities as part of the defence portfolio remains there, but also that the Australian Cyber Security Centre remains as part of that and uh, has an important voice in that because they're only able to function effectively as a defensive agencies because of their mm. access and insight to the capabilities of our opponents and their threat intelligence. If you start to separate those things out and make it a civilian agency or remove it from the defence mm. portfolio, I think you substantially weaken it. And I really question the value personally of having an extra minister on the top of that, uh, mm. uh, looking over the shoulder of a very capable structure already. So I, I think the way it's working at why it's working now is good. There's an incredibly close working relationship between defence and home affairs in the mm. areas in which they cross over. It's often that the legislation can be initiated through the home affairs portfolio um, and the capability applied through the defence portfolio. And I think that's been working very well. Thank you. Um, I, I have uh, another uh, question uh, f from one of the academics um, here at RMIT, Professor Mark Greger, uh, and it's about uh, Australia having the need for an infrastructure security assurance regime, I suppose, in essence, to, uh, from a cyber perspective, uh, assure the protection of, of all the layers of, of infrastructure that, that we have. It, and, as, and in terms of your, your earlier comments, you talked about regulation. Do, do you think there's going to be a need to move down that uh, security assurance path or, or is the current situation, uh, you know, uh, enough to, to deal with, 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 with the challenges that we face? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, that's something that the critical infrastructure reforms seek to do partially by imposing the obligation on critical infrastructure providers that they have a risk management plan and that they work through their vulnerabilities, both in the cyber realm, but also in the physical world. And I mean, that's essentially a self-assurance model. Um, the, if you um, say that you have a risk management program and you um, provide it to the government and demonstrate that you've got it, um, then that's the tick you need under the Critical Infrastructure of, uh, Act to meet your obligations. We're not gonna then go and assess it and say, oh, we don't think this is right and should do it this way and not that way. Um, and I think that's an important way to start down this road because um, that's the first thing, the first base that we want everyone to get to. Um, it's possible that as part of one of the other elements of the critical infrastructure package that that is assessed more rigorously for a smaller subset of the most systemically important uh, infrastructure providers. So if you're thinking about what is known in the legislation as a system of national significance, mm. that uh, gives the Home Affairs Minister the power to designate uh, 
uh, an, an entity as a system of national significance, and then the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs to apply specific obligations mm -hmm. to them. And that's for those operators for whom which whom without which we could not operate successfully as a country. And bespoke arrangements can be imposed upon them that you could look for a higher level of assurance because those ones are, are so systemically important. No, thank you. And um, again, I, I suppose a related uh, question from one of our academics is about research and it's about how Australia can improve our research and development with the UK and the US in terms of the new Oculus sort of agreement. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is a really exciting opportunity uh, for Australian universities in particular. We are looking to really deepen our cooperation and links with the US and UK higher education sectors in the research field, but not just research. We're going to combine uh, defence industry and private sector insights as well. And you'll see under AUKUS, certainly the uh, big ticket items that have attracted the most attention is uh, you know, nuclear propelled submarines in, in a decade or so's time. But at the front end of those capabilities and those cooperation is going to be things like um, cyber warfare capability, artificial intelligence, quantum computing. And so we really want to deepen those links and those cooperations um, because I think the reality is that kind of sensitive uh, research, which has military applications, but may, might, might fall in the dual use category, is just not something you can do anymore with someone who is a strategic competitor and potential adversity, adversary. It's really only something you can do with a trusted partner uh, mm. like the United States, the United Kingdom. So we really want to encourage universities in particular to lean into that and to, mm. and to really develop those links further. Thank you. Uh, we have a, another question from an international perspective, and it's about the role of Israel. You know that that, that Israel's, uh, you know, considered at the forefront of of cyber security and uh, threat intelligence uh, technology. Is there the potential to develop a closer relationship with Israel around their cyber capabilities, or uh, potentially to you know include them within the Five Eyes? Yeah, I think that's a, a relationship that um, could be developed and could be uh, extended much further. I think there's real potential upside there. Obviously, they have some very unique uh, and very effective capabilities because they've faced uh, an existential threat since their uh, very existence, and that um, produces a particular mindset and a very creative uh, one. And for a relatively small country, a, a really highly capable uh, tech sector. Um, our Trade Minister, Dan Tien, has said that on the medium term agenda uh, is a free trade agreement between Australia and Israel. And one of the things I would like to see as a priority for that free trade agreement is removing any remaining obstacles to investment and the movement of people uh, in the tech sector, because I think we do have a lot to learn from them and a lot to exchange with them. Um, so I'd like, really like to see that prioritised uh, if we're successful in being re-elected. I think that will be a really um, a top uh, and important agenda to pursue. OK, thank you. Um, a slightly different topic is there's been a lot of discussion around foreign interference and the question is does foreign interference have a relationship to cyber security mm, an extremely close relationship a kind of a symbiotic relationship um uh, one of the things we saw during the pandemic when Australia's international borders were closed was the acceleration of an of an existing trend where um, foreign state intelligence services were seeking to recruit potential sources um, and assets online rather than physically and in person. And they may then seek to transition those online relationships to being in person mm -hmm. relationships, or they may never um, seek to formalise it in person and just keep it online. Um, we saw people uh, in academia, yeah, sensitive uh, uh, research in the private sector and classified clearance holders in government being targeted particularly through platforms like LinkedIn mm. where their expertise and their access for information was identified and where unsolicited office offers um, and attempted cultivation recruitment occurs and it may on the surface appear completely legitimate initially it might be a um, independent or third party consulting firm that uh, that commissions um, some research from you uh, but then uh, tries to develop that relationship further and tries to access uh, information through you that is compromised um, it's really important that we all anyone who has a proximity to um, classified information or sensitive research which is of value to foreign states be very uh, personally aware of those risks and those approaches and be very guarded uh, about uh, any approaches you see online and it may not necessarily be through a traditional platform like LinkedIn um, mm. they might approach you through an online dating service as well 
um, what they'd be seeking to do is match um, your uh, private sector or government credentials against an online dating app and work out that is an opportunity or a vector to approach you through and try to seek to cultivate you. Um, and so we need to be kind of uh, very discerning uh, about those kind of approaches that you might receive online. And it, it's particularly accelerated during the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, the, the other questions um, in relation to COVID and really, you know, the, the, the impact that COVID's had on Australian universities in terms of being able you know to bring in international students to teach cyber security or uh, you know to be able to uh, generate you know the next generation of 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 Australia's cyber workforce it's what's your views in terms of boosting a the university sector's capability to teach cyber security. It, should there be things like, you know, reduced hex fees if students study cyber security? Should there be other uh, ways to promote cyber security to give Australia, you know, this sovereign capability? Yeah, one of the things I was been really impressed by during the pandemic is the resilience of the international student market, despite the fact that our borders were closed. Obviously, a number of students were able to get here before our borders closed and stayed here, but a number of others who weren't able to get here elected to continue to study online, and that demonstrates the, the value of an Australian higher education qualification um, and the willingness, even without the experience of getting to live in Australia, of continuing to study online. So that was a really positive thing. And um, one of the other things that I think revealed by the pandemic is um, that some universities and some faculties in particular um, don't have sufficiently diverse international student markets that they are reliant on uh, some countries uh, as a source destination for students too much. Um, China is obviously the most uh, significant uh, provider of international students uh, for Australian higher education institutions and some universities and some faculties are particularly dependent on mm -hmm. them. And that's a financial risk as much as anything else because we have seen the Chinese government uh, attempt to dissuade Chinese students from coming to study in Australia. I think the reputation of our higher education institutions um, will prevail over the, that kind of discouragement, but uh, it's, it's not unforeseeable that uh, China government could refuse visas or refuse exit um, rights to uh, Chinese students seeking to study in Australia in the future. So it's really critical that uh, we do diversify our international student market. I know that's easier to say than it is to do mm. because there's just high demand uh, and a high willingness to pay from countries like China, which are growing rapidly and uh, are very wealthy and value our, our higher mm. education uh, services. But it's something that universities need to proactively engage in and seek to mm. do to manage those risks. Thank you. And, and the next question is is linked to that again around sovereign capability. It, it, is how do you think you know the university and the research sector in Australia, you know, can improve its uh, cyber capability on behalf of the country? Mm. Yeah, well, this is a really important um, part of AUKUS. Again, um, we want uh, the Australian higher education sector to be working very closely um, in our national interest, helping to train our future um, workforce, both in the cyber realm, but other areas. I mean, for example, um, we haven't never had to train uh, nuclear engineers before mm. to serve on submarines. And now that's going to be a critical um, capability, which we're going to have to grow from home uh, in a relatively short space of time. And so there's enormous opportunities for universities to really lean into this and to capture those opportunities. And government is very open minded and working with the sector um, to help you enable you to do that. And we're looking for creative solutions to those problems. Um, so it's up to universities uh, to come forward with those suggestions about how you can meet those needs, which are kind of, uh, yeah, an enormous opportunity. Thank you. Uh, we're coming to the end of, 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 of a very interesting conversation, and I'd like to just give you five minutes to uh, share with us your your thoughts around cybersecurity and to wrap up, you know, where, you know, if there were any sort of points that you wanted to raise that you didn't have the chance to. Thanks, Matthew. Look, I think we've really covered a lot of great ground. Um, I just want to thank all of you uh, for participating today, for your interest in cybersecurity. Um, you have a really critical role to play in the defence of our nat nation in very uncertain times. Uh, this is going to be a very challenging decade. You might have heard the Prime Minister say we're living in the most uh, dangerous and uncertain strategic environment since the 1930s. Uh, and I firmly believe that this decade does not have to to end in the same way that the 1930s mm. did. But if it's not going to end that way, it requires something of us. It requires you know, very clear plans, very clear policies to uh, safeguard our interests uh, and our values. 
both in the physical world and in, in the cyber realm and uh, your, uh, your organisation, uh, your future students, um, your future graduates have a really important role to play in that. So thank you for your interest in the national security of our country and I look forward to crossing paths with um, you uh, and your students for, for many years to come. Excellent. Um, thank you, Senator Patterson. Uh, I, I'm just uh, just going to do the wrap up now. So I'd like to thank uh, the uh, audience uh, for attending and thank you for posting uh, a wide variety of, of, of different questions uh, that we're able to uh, present uh, to Senator Patterson. Uh, a public recording of this webinar uh, will be uh, made uh, available and uh, will be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, so thank you all for attending uh, today. Uh, I hope you all, all have a, a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.